thinking Hollywood. I'm thinking Los Angeles. What are you trying to say, Max? It's desperate on the slide. They're not laughing with you. It's fine. Just put me on once. And filthy on the bottom. <laughs> the journey down is a well-worn route every star must take. Call me an old hippie, but I just think we should love each other a little bit more. <laughs> Don't hold your breath, though. And there's no dignity involved. I'll do anything. What are we here? And when it's all over, nothing is left that they wouldn't stoop to. There's only one question remains. Don't you know who I am? The words you green of Sheba El Shaharazad, the rock and roll legends, big cigars, always golden champagne in your limousine, hiding all those secrets behind the black glass screen. What's the average shelf life of a celebrity? Uh, nowadays? Nowadays, yeah. Three weeks. These days, the shelf life of celebrity is just getting smaller and smaller. Shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. It depends on whether the celebrity has merit mm -hmm. or whether it's a shooting star. Yeah, I think there's, there's more and more famous people and they're lasting less and less time. No, I think these days there are so many preservatives, additives, E-numbers, refrigerators, I think there's no such thing. Oh my God, you know, how long have I got? Right, you know, you make it sound like a hairdo. You know, put her under the dryer. How long has she got? Oh, another 20 minutes. The life expectancy of today's celebrity has never been shorter. Each year, as the number of actors and pop stars increases, the individual celebrity's grasp on fame weakens. There's always someone else, fresher, taller, thinner, or simply more talented, coming up behind. Today's star knows there's little hope of eternal fame. So what you need to do, I suppose, is A, have absolutely no shame and no self-knowledge. Do anything the people who run the papers tell you. Pose with anything, wear anything, lose any amount of weight, tattoo any ridiculous thing, tattoo your son's name on your ass. Anything that will get you in the papers, anything that will keep you cutting edge. You know, don't have any shame about it. Don't think, I'm looking like a hooker or mutton dressed as lamb. I'm looking like a fucking twiglet wearing a pair of leather shorts. Don't care about that. You'll end up fucked up, deformed, with eating disorders and stupid tattoos, but you'll have had that extra year of fame. No star can ever afford to feel secure on top. I think there was a classic speech that um, Nelson Mandela did. He mentioned about never suppress yourself, never make yourself feel small for others' insecurities, and that's what girl power's all about. Well, Jerry Halliwell, I mean, some I think people, people are yeah, in gold yeah, pretty bored Jerry of her. Jerry Halliwell. say everything about a person, you think. You know, how is she going to fill her day when she's not posing for photos and getting a little doggy to stroke and wearing short shorts and starving herself to the point of anorexia? You call me an old hippie, but I just think we should love each other a little bit more. She's standing there on the stage, the spotlight's been turned off, the people have gone home. The music stopped and she's still tap dancing away. You know, everybody needs good parenting. You know, I need good parenting and guidance. And I think Tony and Cherie are great parents for this country. Jerry Halliwell, known by all, loathed by many. Addict of the publicity treadmill, she's omnipresent, promoting her career, spouting her beliefs, and revealing her body. Force fed every detail of Jerry's lifestyle, the public seem on the verge of rejecting her. Jerry's teetering on the top, staring down at the bottom. Fame can be addictive, and what we've seen with people like Jerry Halliwell and their need to constantly be in the public eye is a product of the fact that they need to feel validated, they need to feel accepted, they need to feel good enough. The minute that it stops being fed into their system, the minute that people stop looking, there's almost a question as to well, what's the point of existing. And the classic example of a publicity stunt was when she turned up to the Bridget Jones premiere. Oh, Jerry! Pluck some young kid out of the audience. Who wants to be my date? Because I haven't got a date. Jerry! Jerry! 
and I think most people are clever enough to see through that and see that wasn't just a spontaneous gesture, yeah. that was very much planned. All of us are guilty of getting bored by people. You know, someone comes along, Ali G, Madonna, Boy George, Five, Westlife, and we love it for a period. And then if we see too much of them, we start to think, oh, go away. Like Jerry Halliwell, go away. Get out of my life. <laughs> Celebrities are perishable goods, easily replaced and quick to rot. And today, they're more dispensable than ever. Ten years ago, a recording contract might last for six albums and ten years. Nowadays, if the first single fails to make the top ten, the star could be chucked out of the charts forever. From a magazine from just a few years ago. Tony Mortimer from E17 recording with new band. They never happened. North and South, own TV show, disappeared. The lineup for the Smash It's Tour, 1997. Chill, never heard of them again. All Saints, now split. Entice, vanished. Code Red, don't know where they are. Jimmy Ray, missing in action. 21st Century Girls versus Hepburn, who rocks the most? Well, unfortunately, history shows that neither. It's quite weird, the fact that we were called 21st Century Girls <laughs> and we were dropped before the official 21st century. <laughs> but, like I said earlier, we were, we were like two years before our time. Yeah, we really were. <laughs> By the time this show goes out, bands like here say, hopefully it will be forgotten and there'll be another one on the block. My ten-year-old daughter the other day, I was watching MTV or some shite with her, and she said, I said, do you like that? She said, yeah. She said, but they won't last long because there'll be a new band soon. Now, if a ten-year-old can work that out, we all can work it out. Down. Will you please leave the big brother house? Down. For the celebrity in search of shelf life, media exposure is vital. Here's the world press. They want to get a picture of the Britain's best known daddy and chicken lover. <laughs> but some celebrities' time has come and gone before they even realise. The big brother contestants were famous inside the house. But as soon as they stepped outside and away from the cameras, their fame began to diminish because they had nothing more to offer. I want people to say, um, oh, do you remember that guy? He, he started off at Big Brother, he's done so well now. He's an Hollywood actor. He's married to Hell Berry now, isn't he? <laughs> that's, what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking Hollywood. I'm thinking Los Angeles. You know what I'm saying? I'm thinking I'm going to be up there with the Hollywood stars one day. <laughs> If you're uh, just appearing on um, Big Brother, then it's huge and it's massive while it's on TV. And thereafter, you are on that show. But are you famous? Are you a performer? Are you a personality? Do you have the bigness of character to be beyond that TV show? The Big Brother cast are part of a tragic species, the Klingons. People whose celebrity has vanished, leaving them with nothing to cling to but the memories and the hope of a spare party invite. You've all got 15 minutes of fame. How long have you both got left? Uh, it's long as we still keep our integrity and uh, still keep our ideas going. Nasty Nick would turn up at anything. I remember going to, it was from um, jewellery ex exhibition or something, and then there he was, Nasty Nick, you know, having his photograph taken with, you know, some middle-aged, you know, Jewish women who just bought half the shop and didn't, obviously, you know, those kind of people are always, will always exist. They cling on because otherwise they'll have to go from having free champagne to, to waiting in a queue at McDonald's. And that's a real fall to have. What's the benefit of coming tonight? Well, there's no benefit. Uh, as such, we're here to celebrate uh, 10 years of Esquire. We're both read Esquire, so therefore, what's, you know, very appropriate that we're here to, to wish it a happy birthday. I'm just loving Esquire. And I'm loving this event, so it's like happy 10th anniversary for them. I'm not the kind of person to go to um, every single celebrity bashment, I call them, because it's not worth it. It's like you don't go out just to go and say, OK, there's going to be free champagne in the goodie bag. Oh. Chris. For every newcomer on the scene, there are the old hands, seasoned in the art of celebrity survival. <laughs> and then obviously everybody likes to keep up their profile and uh, so I 
absolutely right. If people do see your name and photograph on the paper, it jogs the memory. And I mean, we are freelance entertainers in a sense as well. We do after dinner speeches and you know, ladies' lunches and so on. Would you like me to say? If you're the Premier and Brian May turns up and his clogs, you know. <laughs> it's time Brian to go home. May. <laughs> You've got to go. But after enjoying the glamorous premieres, the celebrity discovers that their once friendly press has overnight become the enemy. Look up, look up, look up. It's a game of deadly pursuit. Oh, I'm sorry. What I'm happened? Saying, I'm sorry, I didn't mean... The moment the prey shows signs of weakness, the hunter moves in for the kill. It's just very difficult to know how to handle your press. Um, if you try and manipulate it, it bites you back. If you don't, it still bites and hurts. Um, if you care, it hurts deeply. If you don't care, it shows. And you'd never want to be the sort of person who doesn't care. I've had women that, you know, set me up because they've got the press outside. Just set me up. And I used to think, well, why me? Why me? Why you? Because you put yourself in that position. There's nothing we like more than somebody right at the top of their game being caught with their trousers down. And you can imagine being News of the World editor when suddenly there's an uh, urgent news flash on the Reuters wire that says TV or film actor Hugh Grant uh, arrested for, quotes, lewd conduct with a prostitute in downtown Sunset Boulevard. I mean, you think Christmas has come early. It's humiliating, but occasionally the tabloid savaging and subsequent public ridicule breathes life rather than death into the fading star. Whilst Hugh Grant still would probably want to put me in a cage with a bunch of hungry lions, um, I would argue that however painful it was for him, what it did for his career and Liz Hurley's career by default was propel them into the stratosphere and made them unbelievably more famous. I don't know why women seem even more fascinated with him since that happened. I think they, <laughs> they love the idea that he would cheat on Elizabeth Hurley. When he walks down the street, I bet he never gets anything but people going, all right, Hugh, how are you, mate? How's Divine? Now, irritating, but Divine Brown actually was probably worth about 20 million quid to Hugh Grant. Occasionally you get people say things to you like, um, Hey, didn't you used to be Timmy Mallet? Uh, yes, and funnily enough, I still am Timmy Mallet. I get people stopping me and saying, didn't you used to be Selena Scott? I think somebody once said to me, didn't you used to be Terry Christian? And I was waiting for that day. It's a word association game where you mustn't pause, hesitate, repeat a word or say a word I don't like, otherwise of course... The I'll fall, when it comes, is brutal. Like Celebrities who rely on a unique image or personality will discover one day that the world has tired of them. And yes, and yes. <laughs> I was a little surprised when um, things went quiet after Wackaday. Um, I wasn't quite expecting that, but um, Wackaday was so closely associated with TVAM that when new companies and new stations started, it was like, right, we've done that, onto something new. Okay, well, I'll join in with whatever's new. Uh, yeah, time for a new face. He's a bright man, but people, they feel uncomfortable looking at a frankly middle-aged geezer looking like a kind of mental patient on an outing with a big mallet. And it's not, he's got to change the act. He's not going to reinvent himself. Your ego does take a battering, yeah. And you think, oh, oh, I'm not popular anymore. Nobody loves me. I, but I'm really nice, honestly. Oh, please. <laughs> And then you realise that, hang on a second, if you are needing other people's reassurance that you're OK in yourself, you're not really OK, are you? No! Overnight, for particular artists, their strengths are transformed into weaknesses. The unique appeal that once set them apart inevitably becomes jaded and often intensely annoying. If you're quite an absurd character, and your whole character is built around being Timmy Mallet or Christopher Biggins, where it's an absurd, rather irritating personality. I think you tend to have your five minutes of fame or five years, however long that spell is. And the moment the public wears thin of your act, that's it. Welcome to the Why Don't They Get Rid of That Northern Git show. <laughs>
Hey, we've sent Amanda out Terry again. Christian's style of presenting made him a household yeah. name. It also made him a target for death threats and the focus of blame when the word was axed. I remember being in a place called the Market Bar in London. And this bloke comes wading through this crowd like this all the way over to my corner, sort of strangely, looked like a geography teacher, you know, hush puppies and that. But like Mark Lawson, only with more hair and without the glasses. And comes over to me and he goes, uh, he goes, Terry Christian, I said, yeah, he says, I think you're shit. Cheers, mate. Hey, it's only week three of the word and the jip I've had, you know. Every morning when I go in, after, the first thing I have to do is deal with all my hate mail. Mind you, I usually get most of it written by lunchtime. Terry Christian was a classic example of somebody who had his time but was quite irritating. And so when the time came to kick him, we had huge public support. Yeah, you would get like this, uh, you'd get loads of sympathy off the public saying, we think you're all right, and I'd be thinking, well, you know, saying, oh, I feel sorry for you, and da, da, da. And I think, well, hang on a minute, and this is like by, by the end of the, and, I, and by the end of like doing the word, I'm earning like a quarter of a million a year, and they're feeling sorry for me. <laughs> I was like, listen, you know, feel sorry for starving children, and. You know, and sick people and old age pensioners don't feel sorry for me. Here, hang on, you! Look what you've done! It's the most basic error in the celebrity handbook. A fervent belief in their own immortality. <laughs> See? Easy when you know how. The artists most prone to attack are soap stars, who often mistake the character's popularity for their own. The advice I would give is to tell people if they've got bath and soap, not to think about leaving and going into other things, because there's only probably about 25% of them actually get back on in, in major screen. I mean, years ago, Chris Quinton came to me. I used to do a lot of work with Chris. Um, many people won't remember, he was Brian Chilsley in Coronation Street. And Chris was a, a top entertainer, a really good entertainer, a good singer, he had a band, and we used to go all over the country um, doing personal appearances and, you know, gigs, you know, with the band. And when he told me he was thinking of going to America and asked me if I'd go with him and act as his agent, I told him, I said, Chris, I think you must be wrong in your head. And um, you don't hear Chris anymore. Back soapies. I always say I'm leaving the soap to go and do something different. And where do you ever see them again? You don't. They're gone. They've had their moment and they're gone. I think that must be really, really horrible. I would hate that. Uh, some people think that's how it is with me, I think. What really underlines the fact that celebrities are just products, are just things to be used up and thrown away, is that weird career path that has happened so many times, it's almost a joke. When somebody's big in soaps, popular with the girlies, some like Adam Ricketts, Sean McGuire, the next thing, their dull, spud-brained managers or agents say, here, boy, here, son, we'll get you in the charts, you can be a pop star. They're going to hit the mid 30s because you know, sell five copies of record these days and you get somewhere in the charts. But what also happens is then eventually, six months down the line, bang, shock, Sean Maguire dropped by a record company. Bang, shock, Adam Ricketts nowhere to be seen. Bang, shock, they're in panto, someone like Cleethorpes. We don't want pop soap stars to be pop stars. We want to know that you work in the pub, you work in the pub. <laughs> you work on the market stall, that's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to go off and do this great music video with gorgeous hunks. A lot of soap stars, they've all been to stage school, they learn to sing, dance and act all at the same time and they go into acting and they've still got this, I think pop stars are always slightly more famous than soap stars and that's what they want, they want to be massively famous and they've often got great voices, I think it's just their taste in music is terrible.
For other celebrities, it's not that they make catastrophic career choices. The sad, simple truth is that they go out of fashion. Pop star Sunita pranced her way through the 80s, but her sell-by date was clearly stamped on her lycra, and when the decade was finished, so was she. Because the first Sunita launch thing had worked, the fact that I then started to grow up and wanted to be Janet Jackson and change the image to the, you know, to the record company, they thought this was a disaster. It was like Shirley Temple can't grow up. With celebrities, it's so much easier to attribute failures to the outside. It was the wrong cover for the album. It was, you know, the wrong pizza that was served up the night before the concert. It was whatever else. You know, when you attribute things outside, for the moment, it's great because you don't have to look inside. Long term, though, that's when problems begin to happen because if the problem genuinely resides within and you're not addressing it, it's only going to get worse. The world as we know it is about to end. David Icke. Sudden death. The fastest way to go is live on television. The medium that once sustained the celebrity now becomes the instrument of their execution. So you're all in the turquoise, which of course is the, mm. is the collar. Mm. Hold on, sir. Yeah, that's a good start. Fill your mouth full of sweets. <laughs> yeah. The Wogan interview was catalytic because it got such a massive audience um, so, that, um, you know, there I was uh, on public show at a time when Basically, I didn't know what day it was or what planet I was on. When we think, it is not a vacuum. We, when we think, we create an energy field. I think when he came on in his shell suit, um, we thought, well, this is, <laughs> this is quite funny, to be absolutely frank about it. Um, but um, as he went on and started explaining that this color was the color that was going to save the world and so on, I don't think, to be honest, people were laughing. I think, I think we were just gripped with, with the eccentricity, if you like, of the whole thing. The press claim that you claim to be the son of God. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes, you see, the thing is that uh, see, it's, quite, it's quite funny, really. Afterwards, uh, people were saying, oh my God, did you see what David Icke was saying? But we weren't, we, there was no deliberate intent of, hey, let's book David Icke and let's rubbish him, if you like. Was it, was it a great shock for you to discover this at 38? Well, I, th I think the, <laughs> I, think the wor I think the word is gobsmacked. But again, again, you know the best way of removing negativity is to laugh and be joyous. So I'm delighted that there's so much laughter in the audience tonight. But no, um, it's a... But just let, just let me, just let me say this. They're laughing at you. They're not laughing with you. Fine. I remember the conscious level, if you like, was experiencing this, this um, laughter and ridicule and all that stuff. And it was like desperate um, because, you know, that's the level where the self-esteem uh, has to manifest, otherwise we feel so bad about ourselves. And uh, it's going, oh my God, what are you doing? What are you saying? Oh my God, life's over, you know. I say wait and see. Ladies and gentlemen, David Icke. Thank you. And I went from uh, walking down the street, uh, oh, hello, you're that David Icke, aren't you? Hello, mate, yeah, what do you think of, what do you think of, the, of, the, of the match the other night then, you know? To, uh, being laughed at by people wherever I went. I couldn't walk down any street in Britain without being laughed at by most of the people. And after the world's demise, Terry Christian found he wasn't taken seriously either. Well, at the end, everything's all over. I'm all washed up. I mean, to be honest with you, um, when the word finished, there were a few other projects uh, that people put forward. were quite a lot about, I think there's like 11 or 12 projects that other people flung at Channel 4. I think at the time it was just, you know, maybe they weren't right for me or for them. Nothing lasts forever, does it? The degree of hysteria in fame doesn't last forever. It moves on to a different stage and 
other things will come along. I am certain that other things will come along in my career. I know that they will. What are you talking about? You're nutty! I can do some things to make the doors open. I can knock quite loudly. I can ring. I can smile. I can sign autographs. And I can smile and make people's day. <coughs> and uh, opportunities will come. The first time we went to Australia, and Canada, I mean, there was, you know, it was mayhem. It was the usual kind of, you know, Bay City Rollers, Beatles, you know, cliches. And then about five years later, I went back to do some kind of small club tour. And after getting off the plane, there was like one camera crew and one lovely fan with a teddy bear, a koala bear. And I did laugh. I thought it was very funny. You know, I just said, isn't it funny how people forget? <laughs> I'd like to introduce somebody now who doesn't really need any introduction. On my left, Joan Turner, yay! 60s television star Joan Turner was one of the highest paid female entertainers of her generation. I'm going Bethlehem, so the Holy Bible says. There we are. Bag lady, you see. I never thought I'd be a bag lady in Los Angeles, but here I am. But I'm on the up. There's my bank, Bank of America. There's never anything in it, but it's my bank. Reminds me of England, in a way. What are you filming, darling? A bit low, aren't you? <laughs> you naughty boy. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Do you like it? That is incredible. I found it in Danny Lauro's dustbin. <laughs> Five years ago, Joan came to America to star in a cabaret act. It was the last time she worked. She's been living in L.A. ever since. There's me and Queenie. That's me and the Beatles. I'm lying on some woman's lap. I think I was aiming at becoming a lesbian. I can't make up my mind about that one. <laughs> I was a millionaire. I went bankrupt in. Uh, I went mad because I loved parties. I had this beautiful house in Marble Arch. Um, and I used to entertain all the press there. And they all the press, the British press, know me, the ones that are still alive. <laughs> They all remember. They want, want a party, go to Jones. But Jones entertaining was not only expensive, it was also highly addictive. I've had a drinking problem for many years, which you know about, because it was all in the Sunday Mirror and the Mail anyway. And uh, I suppose the biggest regret I have that I didn't stay along with AA. I mean, Anthony Hopkins was my sponsor in England, you know. And I just... I just couldn't give it up. Let's get a hand up in a moment. At the start of the star's decline, the first visible symptom is a sudden lapse in artistic integrity. Go, Cowboy George! Excuse me. I'm looking for Templeton Peck from Peach Pear Management. Is that you? Ah, uh, yeah, that's, that's me. I'm looking for Cowboy George. Well, I'm almost in my board, George Hyatt. I appeared on the A team because they offered me loads of money. <laughs> More money than I'd been offered to do anything in quite some time and I thought well why not and originally um, they asked me they told me I was going to play myself which I thought well it can't be that hard what are you trying to say man but when I got to America they turned the tables and said oh well, we want you to talk like this and you know we want you to be Cowboy George I agreed to book Cowboy George well I'm Boy George and I agreed to play the Arizona Forum Forum oh so basically you know I did it uh, it's very good in German. I've seen it in, in German. It's, I'm a fantastic actor in German, and I'm quite good in French. But the English one is embarrassing. Well, that's right. I mean, pay or play, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, you can't help being cheap. What can you do, you know? I got asked to do through the KO ones. Um, and it was like, they offered me all this money. I was thinking, well, I mean, round our way, who lives in a house like this? It would have been like the shopping channel to all the local kids. Ooh, nice. And, you know, oh, DVD, you know what I mean? Like, oh, computer. Oh. You can pile it in, right, when's he out? I was inundated with all sorts of things to do, and 
one was a record contract and scripts and all sorts of things. And you can't, I had to sit down and think to myself, what do I want out of this? And should I do that, that, this and that? Or should I kind of stare in, the, in, the, in what I think is um, what, I've, what I've got quality in, which is presenting? This gorgeous pot-shaped terracotta oven barbecue is £229, which is a bit pricey, but it's not just a barbecue, it actually doubles up to a patio heater. You'll get someone like myself to lift it up. This barbecue is made of terracotta, so it means the outside doesn't get boiling hot, but you can still enjoy the heat from the fire. So what did you cook on it? I've done my spicy Caribbean burgers. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Did you make them at home? Made, no, I made them here in studio earlier on today. Yeah, some them. Cool. Do you want them on duty? Loads of different <laughs> seasonings in there. <laughs> <laughs> Any time I get a phone call from them to, to do that, I'm so enthusiastic and I love it. And the adrenaline is just brilliant because I love presenting on their program. Hey, Darren, it's like there's a party in my mouth and everyone's <laughs> excited. <laughs> it's beautiful. I love it. God bless daytime TV. God bless late night TV because it puts shoes on my kids' feet. I'll do anything. We call it the Keith Chegwin syndrome. Absolutely nothing, nothing is left that they wouldn't stoop to. Paul. Hey! Stand standing! I'm talking! So my advice to any celeb is going down, down the slippery slopes, take it like a man, or just leave the country. The star now faces the ego-bruising reality of rejection from the once safe haven of the celebrity circuit. Very recently, I was um, in the West End and with some friends from America, and we wanted to go for a drink, and we went to a place called Abigail's Party, which is a private members club, which had I been in my hat, I would have got in. But they were like, sorry, it's members only, and they didn't recognize me. Hello. Don't you know who I am? But the thing is, they might turn around and say no. I've actually been to two clubs, and this, a, a bouncer wouldn't know who I am, and I'll queue up and I'll wait and I'll just wait, just like everybody else. Recently, it's, it's, again, it's been Darren from Big Brother, I keep seeing barbs and things, <laughs> and he makes such a song and dance about and it. And Nick as well, Nasty Nick, <laughs> often not allowed in. I've seen um, some hostess from The Price is Right begging to be let in the Met Bar. I've seen Les Dennis begging to be let in the Met Bar. It's quite funny to watch, actually. It sort of brings them right down to our level. And then the star confronts their greatest fear. The moment when they're no longer worth even a single click of the camera shutter. I mean, Prince, he, he put all these rules and regulations on how you could do it, how, you know, how it was going to work. Then he changed his name, then he went to a you know, symbol, then he went to this. And, and people just went, enough. You know, forget it, you're not worth it. Everywhere you go, you're pursued by the press and they want to take pictures of you and catch you doing anything. And then, when you start turning up in your outfit and they don't take the picture, <laughs> it's quite because you're kind of like, da da, hello, and they're kind of focused on something else. People who fall from fame become very, very scared because not only do they lose their fame, they lose a sense of self, a sense of identity. All of a sudden, they're no longer invited to the cool parties, they're no longer in the magazines. So, who am I if I'm no longer this person who the paparazzi want to take pictures of? I think being a celebrity, you've got so much to live up to. Oh, yeah, you know, matter of fact, it's the other way around. You've got a little to hold on to, but you've got a hell of a lot to lose. We have to answer more questions because they took some tremendous punches from Jen. There's not a big one punch in there, but those were good shots. In the early 90s, boxing world champion Nigel Benn had it all. In the beginning, I didn't really have an ego. I just like fast cars, lovely clothes, lovely gold rings. You know, um, we need to do some crazy things like um, book like all the, the penthouse suite at some hotel and just stay there all week. Just partying, 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 partying. I was addicted to, to the opposite sex, just... Um, like someone addicted to heroin and, and just didn't know how, how to wean myself off. And it came to a point where I had a real, real low part in my life, real low part. That I said, wow, if, if this is life, I don't really want no more of it. 
depression is rampant in circles of people that, that have high celebrity. And it's not surprising. You're living in a world that's almost solely created um, and based on things that aren't real. Nigel's depression led to despair. And I was crying in my car and it was um, all gay guys picking each other up and I was just sitting in my car crying, crying, and I think that was the lowest part of my life, not just my career, um, to actually think um, that I'm going to leave this earth now. The lowest I've been, I suppose, was uh, when I was down to like three dollars and I had to go back to the mission which I didn't like doing but they took me in then you you kind of lose you lose a bit of hope you know when when you run out of money that's a that's that's the thing that's held me up so much but at the end of the day you have to find out for yourself and sometimes it can be a very 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 painful experience and sometimes people don't make it through. Come on Pidgeys! Joan is recording tapes to send to the Hollywood studios in the hope of getting work again. I'll probably be doing voiceovers for Disney because it doesn't matter how you look when you're doing voice as long as you've still got the voice and the health and energy to do it it's it and that's what I would love to do it's what I've always wanted to do really. I think someone like Joan Turner, who believes that even the state that she is now can go on um, very quickly to become who she was 20, 30 years ago, um, isn't in touch with, with reality. And the idea that she can get it back again keeps her going. It's probably the one thing that helps her wake up in the morning and, and doesn't make her give up. So in many senses, losing touch with reality is a defense mechanism because reality is much too difficult to face. No, as long as I've got the talent and I can still sing and I still have my health, then I know I can work. If that goes, then I would not delude myself. It's not delusion, it's not that I can still do it. See, that's the point. Walk on, walk on, We're with hope, hope in your heart, heart and you you'll never walk on. on. Just when you thought it was safe, an old star will re-emerge, seeking out the warmth of the celebrity spotlight. Convinced they can make it again. We can't put the lights on. It's too dark. Yeah, but it's so dark, man. Can't we put them on a little bit? I need to brush him. Where's my brush? Fifteen years ago, ventriloquist Keith Harris had a primetime TV show. Today, he's driven six hours from his Blackpool home to perform at Swansea University's ball. They're very noisy at the moment. Hopefully, that uh, when I go on, we can calm them down. But they are rather noisy. They've been sat down there for quite some time, like I said, a bit cold, a bit wet. The poor comic's out there talking to himself. So, uh, mind you, I get paid for talking to myself. Let's see what happens, eh? We actually got put into that pigeonhole of being uh, the children's favourite for many years, you know. And um, so we thought, well, what we'll do, we'll try, we'll try a little bit something different. And watching all the comics on the TV, the alternative stuff and whatever, I thought, well, we can do that. So let's have a, let's have a go and let's try some of the universities. Now, the only way I could get into the unis was to pretend I was a Keith Harris and Orville lookalike. Because they were doing auditions, all the students' unions were doing auditions up in Sheffield. And mostly they were bands and tribute bands and tribute to this, tribute to that. So, and we use all these tribute people. Well, I said, I'm a Keith Harris and Orville tribute. I said, well, if you come along, son, we'll have a look at you. But a student mob will prove daunting, even for an old pro like Keith. Yeah. Look at you. You're to laugh your eyes. Most old stars need to earn a living somehow. If they are willing to put professional pride to one side, 
they might find work in a holiday town. You see, there's no fear of ever being disappointed in a Butlin holiday. I've done Butlins. I've done a gig at Butlins. It was good. I'd like to know more about Butlins. Well, Butlins is a holiday camp, you know, and um, I've actually kind of spruced it up a bit over the years. It's a bit more, um, not, I wouldn't say avant-garde, but they, they, they have sort of bigger acts on now, and I've, I've done it once. All this entertainment is free. The whole Butlins thing is incredible now. It's, it's more... Uh, but it, again, it's a living. I mean, if you're in... I, I really don't want to be seen to slag anybody off it. And uh, I'm not ashamed of doing it at all. You know, so what? I mean, you know, if I got really desperate, I'd happily play there for a whole season. <laughs> hmm. Let me think about it. If a celebrity is appearing at Butlins, uh, having once been on television, it's only about six months before you read their obituary in... Uh, in the Times. There's too many broken hearts in the world. There's too many dreams can be broken in two. <laughs> too many broken hearts in the world. Any hopes of relaunching a career with new material soon vanished, leaving the artist with no choice but to trade on the success they had years before. And celebrity humiliation comes cheap. It's two pounds a ticket to see 80s star Jason Donovan perform in a Luton pub. I tell you, I had his album ten years ago, like it's the first record I ever got bought. Like, I got it for Christmas one year. Brought back all the, <laughs> brought back all the memories from like when I was a kid. He was good. It was worth two pounds, definitely. I'm done. <laughs> so why did you come tonight then? Just take the piss, really. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day. They have to make a living, and if their talent is singing, whether they've got a hit or not, you do what it takes to make put the, the, the dinner on the table. Well, ladies and gentlemen, so we have a huge, huge, huge Swansea Miss Bowl 2001 round of applause for Mr. Keith Harris and Oliver. I can never get an image out of my mind. It haunts me in my worst nightmares of going to the Wandsworth Arndale Centre in South London and hearing the tune that was vaguely familiar, and then it became more familiar, and it was Whispering Grass uh, by Don Estelle, who was, of course, lofty in an eight and a half hot month. What are we here? <laughs> and I thought, how odd to suddenly hear this in the middle of an Arndale Centre on a Saturday afternoon. And then, to my horror, I saw Don Estelle, the man who played lofty, in his full khaki uniform, and he was miming to rusty old tapes, Whispering Grass, to an audience of two, um, two elderly women. And I thought it's very sad that after celebrity for certain people, there's nowhere else to go. That's all he had. I think certain people, you remember them because they're of the time or they're, they're on the telly or they were... I mean, who knows? It's when you look at the people who are in Dictionary Corner in Countdown and in the half-light, you think, isn't that thingy, me, Bob, who used to be in that sitcom thingy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like take that. I mean, only really Robbie's survived to yeah. take that. And then sometimes you'll go to a party and you'll see like Howard. And you'll go, oh my God, it's <laughs> Howard. I forgot he even existed. Or the short, the short Mark. Mark, Mark. Well. Gary Barlow will send you to the Twilight Zone. <laughs> and hopefully he's still there now. In the pubs and clubs of the celebrity Twilight Zone, hundreds of old pop stars are re-emerging to relive their moment of glory. With earnings of up to £10,000 a night, nostalgia is big business for those with mortgages to pay. But what's a nice little earner for the star could be a con for the public. There's two touring bucks fees, and you've got one original member in one, you've got one original member in the other, and the others are doing whatever they're doing now. So you. It's, it's really, you know, you're not really getting the original lineup. Because if you believe that a love can hit the top, you gotta. 
It's awful when you get a group that goes out there and you've only got one original member because at the end of the day, when you've got Bucksbeach, you do want Cheryl Baker. God bless her. You've got three Boney M's, you know, so you can have Boney M playing in Russia one night, you'll be playing in Belgium the same night, and I'll be in the UK. That, to me, is a little bit of a, a con to the public. I think we had the Supremes once, and there's one version of Supremes that's out there, and that's fine, because it is kind of members back from the 70s. But there's one that, like, I didn't recognise any of them. One of them looked like my age, and I thought, my God, do I really look that, <laughs> that I could sing in the Supremes? Everybody wants their own series. I don't know why. <laughs> that was the way the writers planned it. In the world of faded actors, there's only one way they can get their audience back. Then they go to the autograph shows. I've seen them all at these fabulous autograph shows. They have them like four times a year. And there's a gigantic room full of has-beens. I mean, all the old stars of TV shows, of sci-fi movies, and they sell their autographs, and there are thousands of fans standing in line to get them. If you're famous, you have to have a good autograph. It's no good signing a squiggle. A squiggle means nothing. My autograph is the best there is. I am the mallet with the glasses. A lot of people that I know that came up in the business with me, they, their, their popularity stopped. So they just sit down and say, do you remember the old days when I used to do this and do that? What I've done is turned it all around. I've gone out and done new things. But um, I've always felt I was always before my time anyway. Most artists think that they can have it again. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't continue to try. Whether they will have it again is another story. Ron Farris made a comeback, maybe I will one day. <laughs> Don't hold your breath, though. I have spent the last of my money making a, what I think is a really great album. Well, I've definitely had my 15 minutes of fame, and I'm coming back for another 15. <laughs> No, I don't think Sunita has that big pulling power. I mean, I wouldn't book Sunita now. I don't think that you need to be on telly all the time. I think one series a year would be enough. Oh, just one series. Thanks, all. that's all I'm asking. Just put me on once. Go on, please. Oh, well. Thank you so much. Give it a great audience. <laughs> <laughs>